लिखिया सी संविधान ओदी कलम दा खटिया खाईदा ता ही सिफत ना करे जहान मैं फैन हां ऐसी सोच दी फैन हां ऐसी सोच दी दे गए साडे लिए बलिदान we live in india <clears throat> which almost is divided into two nations the rich and the poor people ask me how is this possible in india where a dalit can become the president of the nation and i said but that's the reality that you can have a president who is a dalit in india and yet this scavenging can coexist so religion for the most poor people is a source of security and uh, that's why they cling to it <clears throat> whom else can they blame you know uh, except their own uh, so called scenes in the in the past birth it has become a very natural kind of thing that religious and discrimination is inseparable part of the uh, of the of the coin and uh, i see hope uh, largest hope in the sector of education mm -hmm. and uh, i got into writing books for children right so whatever progress that we have been able to bring about in our four decades of work is only because of hope hello everyone and happy independence day Today I bring to you a dialogue with Martin McQuan. Martin has dedicated his life for the upliftment of the Dalits, the untouchables. We live in two different worlds, the world of the privileged and the world of the Dalits. It's hard to imagine what an ordinary Dalit's experience of independent India is. my purpose behind this dialogue is to understand what are the pains the struggles and the hope of an ordinary dalit so over to martin so hello martin i want to start today's uh, conversation by paying respects to two people who fought the war of uh, social justice one is gumadi vittal rao uh, he yeah. we lost him on 9th of august that's right and hari narke who we yeah. lost also this month so with that i want to start this conversation it's a very interesting day today it's the eve of um, independence day yeah and i remember when india attained independence gandhi ji gave a message to nehru he yeah. said when you are in doubt about any policy or any decision you have to make think about the person at the lowest rung of our society and how is your decision going to affect her or him will yeah. give you a direction and will resolve your conflict yeah so that uh, those words ring in my ears all these years and how i want to treat our conversation today is i want you to think about that last person in the social hierarchy i've heard about you talking on another video about horizontal and vertical discrimination yep so i want you to think about in that vertical discrimination the lowest rug the lowest person in that rug today and i want you to express her or his experience of free india going back all the way back as back as you want to go till today and the future so you are not talking about your views what you have done but my curiosity is for you know i have lived in free india i did, i did not i was not born during independence struggle i have lived relatively a much more privileged life though i was lucky enough to have parents who fought the social justice fight yeah 
but in no way can I say that I have the experience that that person at the lowest rug has. When I saw that picture yeah. of the person carrying Pickle matter. the feces yeah. on his head, I said, I can never imagine that person's pain and the burden of centuries he is carrying on his head. So I want you to express that person's experience, how in their thoughts and their feelings and in their experience, what does life mean? What does history mean? What does future mean? What does independence mean? And how do, how have different milestones through these years have affected both their hope and their despair? And what is in it for them today? So as much as independence is a milestone for all of us, it may or may not be for them. So I just want you to chart out their voice, their feelings for our audience so that they understand that though we may celebrate independence with our realities, there is a stark reality that we need to change. Without that, the freedom from slavery that we looked for, we haven't reached there. So over yeah. to you, wherever you want to start, and then I'll ask you questions once in a while. Sure, it's uh, that's a very nice way to begin, uh, Uday. And uh, I am aware that talking of those things uh, almost tantamount to being uh, branded as anti-national in India today. That you're talking of something which is not real, something which is ashamed uh, the nation. But uh, that's the truth, whether we accept or we do not accept it. Mm -hmm. That we live in India which almost is divided into two nations, the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I was in Rajasthan. Exactly a year ago, a nine-year-old boy, he died, he lost his life because he had, he was thirsty and uh, there was a lot of crowd on the single tap water tap that the school had. And he had drunk water from teacher's pot. And then he was bitten and there was a hemorrhage in his brain. And after about a month of uh, going around seven to eight hospitals, the child died. And even when I went yesterday, <clears throat> there was tension in the village because all the people, the community to which the accused belonged, they said that we will not allow this meeting to happen in the village. There are people who are coming from outside. <clears throat> they are trying to disturb the peace in our village. Mm -hmm. The large deployment of the police force. But as I listen to the stories of the people there in Rajasthan, even today, when a so-called upper caste man or a woman dies, the Dalit women are supposed to weep as if somebody of their own has died, you know, something like that famous film called Rudali shows. The man, they actually shave off the heads and they go and uh, <clears throat> do the uh, shok. They express the mourning for almost seven to eight days. The Dalit men are still not allowed to wear the colored <clears throat> headgears. In those, in those villages even today. So this is what we are into 2023 as we are celebrating 76 Independence Day tomorrow. My experience of all these years is when I spoke about uh, what I saw in the villages. People did not believe. I remember the two Indian professors who found me all the way when I was in the US to find where I was staying and came and told me that, uh, I mean, we have seen you in that film, but we, this is too much. This is an exaggeration uh, of what you are saying. Mm -hmm. So even when they were watching the visuals, actual visuals, they thought somebody was acting, you know, those uh, episodes and not ready to believe. People ask me, how is this possible in India where a Dalit can become the president of the nation? 
And I said, but that's the reality that you can have a president who is a Dalit in India and yet the scavenging can coexist. Mm -hmm. So I remember about uh, 43 years back, you know, when I was at the age of uh, 21, just passed out of my undergrad in Xavier's college. And uh, I, my teacher was a very funny uh, professor of political science. And he told me, he challenged me actually that uh, you're a very bright student. Uh, if you have the aspiration to become an IAS officer or something, you can go and do your further studies. I give you a guarantee that you will get a degree, but not the knowledge. But if you're really seeking knowledge, please go and live in a village for two years. And I, I give you a guarantee that you will not get the degree, but you will have the knowledge. Now, the choice is yours. Well, I came from a rather poor family and uh, it was a very tough choice. But I, I chose that. Partly I had my own personal experiences, which were not that glaring as what you see in those kind of films. But yes, I faced uh, those kind of discriminations as a child. So when I went to those villages and I stayed with the people, I lived with them three days and three nights every week, that openly, that actually opened my eyes. And my teacher had given me uh, a mantra Keep your eyes open. Keep your <clears throat> ears open, but keep your mouth shut when you're in the village. I didn't understand quite well what he meant because I was very angry with what I saw. I saw that the man from the dominant caste would come, do, went to go to any house of a Dalit woman and do anything what they want in the daylight and nobody would uh, dare to protest. And then I understood what my teacher was trying to tell me is that only when you keep your mouth shut that you're actually your brain and your emotions will form into a consciousness. You will understand slowly. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I was reminded what uh, same same kind of experiences what uh, what Gandhi had when he went to Champaran and Bihar, you know, and uh, that when Kasturba went to <clears throat> invite women for the meeting, and uh, a woman said she cannot come out because between the two women they had a single sari. It's only when somebody goes out that they put on the sari and go. Yes, so. People can say, oh, that happened, you know, 100 years ago. And very convenient to forget and to accept that the same thing happens even today. And just before maybe I end my primary comments and, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, we did apprehend that with the third wave of the corona coming in, <clears throat> children are going to be affected adversely. And so we said something we must do as a preventive measure for the children. And we targeted the malnourished children in Gujarat, the state which is called, you know, very progressive state and uh, a developmental model. We I didn't, I mean, we didn't have resources, we didn't have money, you know. So we, we targeted only about 5,000 children. Mm -hmm. But that's the reality that of the 10 districts in India where malnutrition is acute, two of those districts, they belong to Gujarat. And uh, it is the tribal children who are the most malnourished and especially the uh, young women, I mean, the girl, girl child. The affidavit filed by the central government in the Supreme Court says that of the 69% deaths of under five children in India, the cause of the death is malnutrition. So one wonders, you know, where we spent our biggest expenditures on defense. 
and uh, you know we want to buy the most sophisticated kind of thing and we cannot uh, fight the malnutrition so what kind of citizens we want to uh, build in for the future you know the kind of uh, nation that you know we want we want to achieve that nation kind of nation we want to make so just uh, four days ago you know maybe i sent you a little program detail draupadi said draupadi tak you know how the situation of women in india have changed between two draupadis the draupadi of the mahabharata with five husbands she was disrupted in the assembly they had the choice to insult her and humiliate her in her private quarters but they said she should be pulled in pulled out and uh, brought to the assembly so that everybody can watch and the whole assembly fell silent and uh, because to protect her would be adharma because it was the right of the kauravas to do what they wanted because she they won her and then what we saw in the manipur the youngest girl who has been gang raped she says that it is not true that the police took us away from the crowd i mean the crowd took us away from the police it was the police who handed us over to the uh, to the crowd mm -hmm. so before 74 1974 we didn't, did not have segregated data of the kind of kind, kind of uh, uh, crimes that took place against both the dalits and tribals in india from 74 we have uh, data for dalits and 79 onwards we have data for tribals bearing two years in between where the government did not publish data and didn't collect it in 45 years about 79962 rapes have happened on the tribal and dalit women in india though we know this is not a complete picture everybody doesn't report to the police station even today i have seen with my own eyes the parents put pressure saying that if you report then you know you bring dishonor to the whole family so keep quiet but even if we believe that data that's the picture but what was more shocking is between 2014 and 2021 Forty percent of the total crime has happened during this last eight years. So, by very logic, that the development should have reduced the crime. Actually, it's the other way around that the crimes have always gradually been going up, and we don't hear about it. So, uh, this is what I have witnessed, you know, over the last uh, four decades. whether i work with the refugees from pakistan living in the uh, border of pakistan on gujarat side called majiranas the kind of poverty which i saw in which they were living and i i lived under a tree there were no there was no uh, they couldn't keep me in their hut very small one so i used to sleep under a tree almost for one year yes and i saw that children had literally no food mm -hmm. so even that's exactly what i see we've been working into different states of india i travel last year to uttarakhand you know to bihar to jharkhand the people who work in the coal mines you know it's a very different kind of country which we don't see in the so called uh, you know media and uh, in our daily discourse mm -hmm. daily discussions but that's what the reality is right so even ambedkar had said you know his last words when he uh, brought the introduced the constitution says no matter how good a constitution it is if the people who are called upon to implement it are bad people it going to be bad constitution mm. nothing wrong with the constitution it's it's with us you know people who are in charge of the implementation so you are right that's what the the world in which we live is a very schizophrenic kind of uh, society in which we live yes and so i want to go back 
uh, India is a very religious country. Uh, we draw a lot from our scriptures and our ancient history. And uh, I refer to it also because I belong to a family, especially my mother has challenged some of the stories and the injustice done to women yeah. in our scriptures also. Yeah. Uh, be Draupadi, Sita, Ahilya. Yeah. From a Dalit's perspective, what do the scriptures or what does the religion mean? This religion for the most poor people is a source of security. And uh, that's why they cling to it. <clears throat> Whom else can they blame? You know, uh, except their own uh, so-called scenes in the in the past birth. Mm -hmm. and because suppose and say that it's only because of those sins that we committed that we're facing the uh, present conditions and that's the story I encountered from village to village people telling me that you know many years ago when the gods came on the earth the Dalit elders were very stupid people and they threw stones on the god and that's why they got the uh, shrap mm -hmm. And the people of the so-called uh, higher castes, yes, they were kind enough, you know, to offer flowers to God, and that for that's the uh, benefits that they earn. And therefore, we had to spend years and years to have a dialogue with the people that that's not true. We have to understand the society and the social structures. Mm -hmm. and uh, when people understood they told us that uh, look we do understand mm -hmm. but tell us that in the state where we are the landless people and we have no other source of uh, income except for the uh, agricultural labor mm -hmm. how do we fight and challenge the person who, who is exploiting us we cannot. Yes. And uh, therefore, they had no option but to, you know, ultimately blame themselves. They couldn't afford the critical consciousness, mm -hmm. which would bring more suffering and more, uh, you know, kind of isolation in the society. But today, as I see that, you know, it's a very, par it's a paradox. The Dalits you know, we, we did uh, one of the largest uh, <clears throat> census on untouchability practices in Gujarat, published in 2010. And not a small survey, 1,569 villages and uh, 98,000 respondents. And if you see that in 91 point or 90.2% of villages, Dalits, they are Hindus, but they cannot enter temples. In southern India, there is the same thing uh, happening with the Dalits who converted to Christianity. And it is happening to the same people who converted to Islam in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. And the same thing is happening with the with the six Ramdasyas. And I, I, I mean, many years ago when I once was in uh, California with a friend and uh, people came to know and they took me all the way to uh, 400 kilometers away to visit this Sikh Gurudwara and just to show me that even in the US, it's only from a certain caste lower rung of uh, society that people come to this Gurudwara and not otherwise. So... It has become a very natural kind of thing that religious and discrimination is inseparable part of the uh, of the of the coin. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I see that uh, we did calculations. The most poor people, they will spend sizable amount of the meager income on making religious donations. The same religious uh, shrines which will not allow them to enter those uh, very places. 
but yet they will continue doing it right now what has happened now is religion so called uh, you know the fanatism part of it has become uh, part of the central political discourse and that brings more insecurity that if you are not with the majority kind of uh, group and agree to whatever they are saying then uh, you know you are uh, anti national anti religious anti indian you know against uh, hinduism so this is uh, and one would definitely expect that the so called uh, clergy would educate people on the what is called uh, religion gandhi was not uh, you know a clergy in that sense but he said that uh, somebody asked him and uh, i have read it that uh, do you believe in scriptures and he says i uphold those books only those books of scriptures which preach non violence truth and non violence yes and uh, <clears throat> something what buddha said about love and compassion mm -hmm. but today we don't find that uh, that clergy uh, group of people on the contrary there is a dominant uh, part of those uh, clergy men and women who go outright to promote violence mm -hmm. uh, and hatred mm -hmm. and uh, people still believe that yes uh, that's that's the religion yes so <clears throat> there is a way we uh, sometimes we don't know what uh, what to do yes so i have a question there so i have looked at a whole spectrum of uh, social reforms movements be it jyoti jyoti ba phule savitri bai phule raja ram mohan roy or even more recently uh, efforts such as andhashraddha nirmulan narendra yeah. dabolkar's so what i want to seek uh, your advice on is what is the better platform on one hand from listening to you i feel maybe instead of making people feel insecure about their god being challenged maybe pick out stories of non violence and compassion and rewrite uh new mythologies that don't necessarily challenge their need for bhakti but focus is more on the qualities that make you more compassionate and non violent on the other hand is the approach of challenging superstitions and the shraddha nirmulan and i think maybe they can all coexist but where do you find more success i think that's a very valid point and i fully agree to it and uh, something what indian constitution says is about uh, development of the scientific temper mm -hmm. uh, and how to how can we rationalize uh, facts our uh, own thinking and uh, i see hope uh, largest hope in the sector of education mm -hmm. uh, and uh, i got into writing books for children is only you know uh, because uh, accidentally i came upon the books uh, written by one of the one of the most respected personality and uh, uh, he is called the mother with a mustache gijubai bataika very very respected name and i was completely for a shock you know when i saw the kind of prejudices both on caste and gender that were inbuilt in those books edited by him about 89 books and uh, i wrote an article about it later and became very controversial and the so called brahmin sabha threatened me how dare you you know uh, criticize a brahmin uh, i said i didn't know he was a brahmin i you know i never saw from that uh, angle but later on definitely the gujarat sahitya parishad uh, called for a special session and uh, they said that uh, 
we must sanitize all our books from the so-called prejudices. Mm -hmm. But I remember that uh, during that uh, course, I must have read about a thousand books, every single book that is available on, in the market. On the children, I, I read. I was doing nothing but reading those books in my office. And I understood why, how the so-called knowledge, which is not rational, is building into a false consciousness among the children. And if we really focused on that, yes, and I want, I understand why Gandhi in his all so-called busy schedules of the national independence struggle was sitting with a lot of people in Varda to look after the new education, you know, the so-called education policy that it must be. That's very important. And, uh, you know, I think immediately after independence for some time, uh, there was this realization that we must address this issue through education. I collected books, started collecting children books from 1947 onwards, and I could collect many books, the school books, textbooks. And I saw that, you know, those kind of stories of communal harmony and everything were part of the curriculum. But last 10 years or 20 years, it is zero. All those stories of communal harmony have been taken off the uh, of the children's books, mm -hmm. especially in the textbooks. And you kind of new material which is coming in, you know, which will uh, show them only one side of the story, where you don't have to question anything. You have to believe it. Yes those kind of exercises which are inbuilt along with that. So people have realized that if you want to maintain the status quo of the power equation, which is unequal, you have to do it only through education, right? So they're using the same kind of thing, using education for their uh, desired goals. But I'm not a person who gets defeated easily and I'm not a pessimist. I I always uh, believe that hope is our biggest weapon. So I, have a question. And, I have one question here. In the, your story books that you write for children, what is your message? What is your message that transforms their minds? What liberates their mind from inequalities in the society? So I, I focus uh, a lot on the... Uh, what I call the fantasy mm -hmm. and imagination mm -hmm. because I I interacted with a lot of children and I, what I saw that they were what they liked most was the fascination so I went to a village for example where two Dalit girls were murdered uh, by the upper caste they were out for defecation and the man were there to uh, they used that place to rape them I went to the village and there was such fear that no everybody locked their doors, you know, because they didn't want to be seen me with, uh, you know, with them. Finally, I spoke to children and I saw that in that most depressing kind of uh, situation, I spoke to children. I asked them, what do you like? What kind of uh, thing that you like in your textbooks? And they brought me my attention, a poem which says, I want to be a butterfly and I want to fly over my entire village and I want to cross the mountains and I want to cross the sea, you know, and I want to go to a new world, you know. So I see that, uh, you know, even from the viewpoint of the uh, psychology that, you know, we do aspire for uh, a better world, at least if not possible outside in our own minds. This is where the fantasies play a very important role. And therefore, I bring in number of stories. For example, I have a book which says, "What our hands can do." And then I have a couple, I have about thirty stories, the the hands of uh, Mother Teresa, the hands of Gandhi picking up the salt, you know, hand of Ambedkar writing the Constitution, hand of uh, Jyotiba Phule saying, "Don't believe into this uh, nonsense," you know. Hand of Savitri Phule teaching girl how to write, read, and write. You know, 
So I got stories from all over the world. Similarly, I have a book which says, what will my fit do and what my fit will not do, you know. So and therefore, Nelson Mandela's fit in prison for 27 years in the prison and yet, you know, uh, very firm saying this is the direction I will walk and not otherwise. The salt march or the million march of uh, Martin Luther King, you know. So I bring in all those kind of stories uh, for the children. Last year or year uh, before last, we uh, created small cards uh, for the children who are in the primary schools and uh, children who are in the mid school. It's a very small kind of uh, card of a mobile size card, a single card for the younger ones and double card for the elderly children. Every week we published a card with this kind of very positive messages. So you can look alphabet and in Gujarati they will say K for you know Kamal or A for Apple. And uh, similarly we'll say J for justice for example and then bring in an imagine, uh, Im uh, imagery and uh, story and some questions. They were like so much by children and we published about uh, 52 cards for 52 weeks and that reached to about 75,000 children in 11 states. So we brought them out into Hindi, Gujarati, Odia and Bengali, right? For elderly children, you know, what happened uh, on that day, you know, in, in the history, in the medical science, in the aviation history, in the space, in the Supreme Court of India, you know, bring in number of positive judgments of the Supreme Court and it had a tremendous impact. And uh, I remember a, a story where, you know, these books have been beautifully well painted, you know, and the artworks have been done so nice. And in our remote village, uh, a Dalit child and the Kshatriya child both uh, were engrossed touching one another reading book. It is the teacher who called the father of the Kshatriya child and said, look, come immediately to the school and see your child touching an untouchable child and reading the book. And uh, the father came and scolded both the children, separated them, scolded them and went back home, thought uh, he did his dharma. And when the school began, they found that these two children were missing and they looked everywhere and they were not to be found. It's only after 20 minutes or so they saw that the, the, uh, the bathroom was locked from inside, you know, and they knocked it open and they saw that the children were reading the book together in the bathroom, locking it uh, from inside, you know. So this is the power of uh, knowledge. You know, and and this is power, of, not imagine, power of imagination. Yes, and uh, therefore, I mean, uh, if it's not possible in the school hours, let's organize it outside the school uh, hours. So we run beam shalas. You call beam shala. About six hundred, seven hundred beam shalas in Bihar, UP, Jharkhand, Bengal, and we say the school will open at five in the evening, <coughs> by four o'clock or four thirty. Uh, children are lining up saying, you know, Jaldi karo, you know, time ho gaya. Huh? And because they want, you know, something what their schools don't give them. The freedom is something which is available here. Hmm? And then this is where they also narrate, you know, why there's a separate queue of midday meal in the schools and how the, you know, teacher, uh, what kind of behavior they do. You know, we, we came up with, we, we uh, came across realities in Uttar Pradesh where a teacher was uh, right in the class was uh, drinking liquor in front of the children and eating the food which is meant for midday meal for the children. And when my, when my colleague challenged the uh, teacher, he said, why are you fighting? You know, I have another class, you know. Even education officer comes uh, sometimes and visits the school. I offer him the same liquor and we enjoy it together. Why should we have a problem? You know, so I see that, you know, this is what the ample opportunities in the field of uh, so-called education where we can, you know, uh, enhance uh, imagination of uh, this thing. So wonderful. This is a great idea, and I, I'll tell you why it resonates with me. Uh, uh, I didn't tell you a lot about me, but 
uh, uh, I call myself today an ethnographer of social imagination. And I was trained in design at NID mm -hmm. in Ahmedabad. Okay. And then I went to graduate school, studied psychology, anthropology, and sociology. And since then, I've been working with a lot of technology firms, change makers, thinking about how to innovate, to change the human experience. And I have learned that change doesn't happen because designers, engineers, economists, or even social workers bring about change. Change happens in people's collective imagination. That's true. That's and if true. you really want to bring about a change in the society, you have to work in social imagination, create yeah. new stories, create new narratives, create new rituals that align with the change we want to make. Yeah. And unfortunately, the wrong kind of imagination is being incubated right now in our society. Yeah. And we can't fight them by fighting those people or those ideologies. We have to fight in the space of imagination. So, yeah. so that's my thesis. And I think what you are doing seems amazing and quite in aligned with my beliefs also. Yeah. Recently, we have uh, set up a museum on Indian constitution mm -hmm. for children. And it's not photographs. They are models. You know, uh, for example, you will have a beautifully crafted uh, laser cut hand design and we'll ask uh, whose powerful hand is this who drafted the Indian constitution and children will definitely say, you know, Dr. Ambedkar was the chair. And then there are two small uh, hands, you know, underneath and says, now look at your hands and imagine what your hands can do. Yes. So and uh, <clears throat> amazing you know we created 55 kind of those models to explain to children you know bring the basic features of the Indian constitution you know so i i fully agree that you know and i have seen in the villages you know when uh, in a, we were running three primary schools you know and uh, unfortunately, we had to close down all the schools because, you know, the government uh, stopped all the funding, saying your activities are detrimental to national interest. And uh, <clears throat> but I, I see we told children, uh, go and uh, do whatever you want in your rooms and, uh, you know, bring your own ideas. And one child created a museum of thorns how many kind of thorns which are available in the wilderness, you know, uh, which kind of thorns, everything is small, bigger, uh, you know, special thorns. Uh, the children, because we are, our temperatures are very high in summers, you know, very well. And children, you know, they would uh, fill up a bottle with water, uh, wrap it with the newspapers, put a string and then uh, you know pull it up and make sure that it rests in the on the tree where the branches and the leaves are the fullest and then lower and bring it down in the in the break time uh, drink water put more water and amazing you know uh, what they can do you know and i'm and your earlier question about uh, the religion I found the best uh, way to deal with the fanatism from the children. And, you know, our teachers were complaining that what do we, what kind of thing we can teach children with these textbooks, which are full with this kind of uh, so-called uh, unscientific stories. And I said, okay, let me try. I'll take the lesson today with the children. And then I told them, the, I was teaching them the uh, story of Nachiketa, you know, that famous story of Nachiketa. And children were listening, listening carefully, and then uh, they said, you know, they called me Dadu. He said, Dadu, you are teaching us, you know, that there is a buffalo coming in from up from the skies to collect the Atma and going back. I said, look, I am not saying, I am only reading and telling you, retelling you what has been written in the textbooks. Do you have any questions? And one child says, I have a question that actually Yamraja, after collecting the Atmas, <clears throat> sitting on the bull and the, when he flies back to the uh, to the heavens or the hell, and if the 
bullock has or the the buffalo has the urge and uh, want to defecate where will the fecal matter fall and you know initially i thought it was one of a very stupid kind of observation but then i said yes i mean that's science right we teach children the law of gravity and a child had the same uh, question to you that what happens to such a kind of thing and demystification therefore you know now if that kind of liberation can happen in the minds of children at this age you know so uh, so th that kind of leads me to another question and i probably know the answer because it's implied in your uh, reference to children being more open to it uh, changing i find that educated people in our country also worldwide uh, scientists nuclear scientists space scientists are not free from casteism yeah they are educated yet they cling on to these societal inequalities how do you explain that well again uh, my son uh, you know <clears throat> younger son who is in the us is the uh, done his phd in physics and uh, he is at the california university and working at princeton university and he used to tell me then uh, when he was doing his phd in the uh, indian plasma research institute in ahmedabad gandhinagar that you have the head of the department of people who give more time to conducting pujas in the campus rather than you know uh, you know uh, in the finding time to tell you this is the stories of what possibilities lie ahead and that's completely political that if you are not that kind of personality you do not get that posting so again it comes back to the same kind of uh, security and more than security i think ultimately people have to make a choice in life who are you ultimately right so does being religious make you casteist yes the more uh, elitist you are the more uh, educated you are this is my very funny experience but i found people very casteist and close to uh, diverse thinking you know they will not engage with you they will not be friendly with you you know uh, and uh, of course post retirement i have seen a lot of people become very progressive you know uh, but not while they are in the uh, position of power mm -hmm. so uh i want to push this idea further so you are saying that if you are religious you are very likely casteist also is that correct yep i would say a lot of my friends and i'm sure people who are educated uh people who have progressed in life are living a better life they would challenge you saying i am religious but i am not casteist how would you prove them that it is they are casteist oh. i i know that i cannot make a general statement mm -hmm. you know so you will there are multiple colors uh, the layers of colors that you find in every every society yes mm -hmm. so i i i have those friends also you know who are uh, who may be religious and yet very very progressive uh, people and supportive of uh, this thing but what i wanted to say that those kind of people are in minority <laughs> that's the point i was uh, driving so i have a parallel here uh, there is a lot of fight against racism right yeah yeah and one of the things message that has come through uh in a fight against racism that each one of us has an element of racism yeah there is no black and white i am not racist i am racist and one has to reflect and examine our own behaviors our own attitudes our own reactions to see 
if it has a tinge of racism in it. Yeah, the same way uh, with regard to gender bias. All of us have that bias, even if we are progressive, even if we are fighting for women's rights, maybe yeah. there is certain amount of gender bias inherent in us. Sure. What is the what is the question we should ask people to ask themselves to check how much of casteist tinge they have? I think uh, there is where Buddha comes uh, as a very dominant figure in uh, in uh, you know to lead us to a better kind of questioning self. Mm -hmm. And he said that look, let's start from ourselves, who we are. Yes. And uh, I mean, my life journey began from the same thing that can I, you know, abolish a caste system for my own personal life? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that led me to redefine what a Dalit is, you know, because normally otherwise you have the same, uh, you may change the word, but your meaning, you know, reference point remains the same and therefore it's, you know, makes no uh, change. And I said, Dalits are those who believe in equality. Dalits are those who practice equality. And Dalits are those who protest inequality. It's only when you make equality as your central value of life that you can create a dominant uh, force which can break divisions of caste and religion and bring various people uh, to the central kind of thing. I am, uh, you know, so I have been upheld like a very inspiring figure uh, in the community side work, but I'm also, I'm also have a lot of uh, people who criticize me a lot and is because of this, that uh, when we did this survey on untouchability, is the first time we did it on both vertical and horizontal. The kind of untouchability practice between the so-called Dalits and the non-Dalits. And within Dalits on the basis of caste. And, you know, that was the two parts became the full study. And we realized that it is the same practices that also of, of discrimination which also happens within the Dalits on the basis of caste. And therefore, you can never abolish untouchability. You can never abolish uh, caste system because we all love it. Yes. And uh, years ago as a student, when I accompanied my professors in the villages and I said, I want to look at the village and then they showed me around different uh, caste society's habitations and I found a collection of uh, every house had a teacup either on the roof or under the roof or over the wall and I was amazed at this beautiful museum of the teacups and I said what are they and they said they are called the Ram Patris. I said excuse me this is called the same Lord Rama that you uphold as a very reverent kind of figure then why are they dirty and stinking? Why don't you clean them up, put in your house and worship? And they laughed and said, no, no, you don't understand. When we as Dalits come to the homes of the so-called non-Dalits to get labor or wages or borrow money, and they're kind people, so they'll offer us tea and then says, okay, get your Rampatra. So we remove the cup from that roof and put it on the floor. And that is where we are served tea inside. I saw this at the age of 17. I'd never seen it before. And after a while, when I came back to the Dalit locality for lunch, I, I saw the same cups there. And I said, excuse me, I'm completely uh, confused. You told me that it is a non-Dalit, keep those cups for the Dalits. What are these cups doing here? And they said, look, we are Dalits, uh, but we are the higher ones. So when the lower uh, rung of Dalits come, then we cannot serve tea in our own cups. So therefore, everybody believes that caste is a very valid institution and it has to remain. And therefore, who is there to protest? Yes. So it can therefore only break if you change the values. And that's what Ambedkar said that look, 
the constitutional values of equality, liberty, and fraternity are not uh, thematic principles. He's, he says they are way of life. It's a way of life. It's only when it becomes part of your blood stream that the society will change and not otherwise. Right? Yes. So I do want to probe a little deeper. Uh, a lot of examples, the visible examples of caste discrimination you gave are from villages. I'm assuming that if people migrate to sit urban areas, the casteism does their does their question is does their experience of casteism change? In certain forms, they change because in a larger metropolitan cities, you know, when you're rushing to catch a train, especially suburban trains in Bombay, where you have no place to stand, uh, where will you have the time to ask, uh, who are you? Mm -hmm. But if you are in a very relaxed journey in the train, in a resort compartment or traveling by bus, the third question will always be there. Uh, what's your caste? Yesterday, I was in a town you know, so from way back to Rajasthan, people came to know that I'm passing this way. So they said, we'll not allow you to go unless you have dinner at our homes. You know, I said, okay, I'll stop back. And so this is a city called Unja. And I saw that there is a common housing society of the apartments. Uh, and they say it's a mixed colony, but a full apartment block was reserved only for the Dalit families. So you have a common playground and common uh, this thing, but your complete apartment block of six or seven floors will be only for the Dalits. In Gujarat, it is very common now <clears throat> not to, the builders will not sell you the property if you are from another caste. So the, the line is very clear. Yes. Uh, earlier it was only in the question of religion, but now, you know, caste is a very dominant factor. And when there are riots happening, then everybody knows, you know, where you are living and which is your place and, you know, where to attack. Right? Yes. So, rural society will have that uh, discrimination every day. In the urban areas, it's, it's uh, you know... <clears throat> So again, uh, I do want to persist with one line of questioning is, so essentially what you're seeing is casteism exists in urban areas, but it's not as visible. So there is no Ramapatra Patre yeah. in the cities or there's no separate uh, uh, well for, um, for the Dalits. But then how do you point out casteism in the city or how do you get people to see their own casteism? Well, now it's very visible and uh, the most uh, disturbing example last year was in Jaipur, the uh, capital of uh, Rajasthan. And the bridegroom was nobody else but an IPS officer. <laughs> and when he uh, said, I'm going to mount the horse in my wedding is beyond uh, imagination kind of police security was provided to make sure that uh, he can mount the horse without any uh, disturbance. Because he was the I, Yes. Between, uh, if you look at that belt, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Rajasthan and Haryana, that's the belt where maximum of these incidents happen. I could count about 95 incidents in the last five years where Dalits are sitting on the horse in the, as a bridegroom and they have been assaulted. They'll be pulled down of the horse. Uh, people will block your way. They will conduct uh, uh, dance festivals on your way so that you cannot pass through. Yes. And uh, people will be beaten up also. I mean, we fight those cases uh, day in and day out when the marriages happen, you know, so and they're do you, increasing. Do you, do you think, uh, again, I think I know the answer, but I'm, I want to ask, do you think globalization or, you know, seeing more urbanization or liberalization, uh, seeing the, the 
the type of stories projected in movies that people watch, having access to internet, uh, having mobile phones in your hand, does that have any influence on inequalities in mind? Oh, a lot of uh, difference. Actually, that's a very positive uh, source of uh, material which happens through internet, you know, that people can write freely. Of course, there are a lot of quarrels, everything. <clears throat> but number of incidents of intercaste and interfaith marriages are increasing. And now there's a lot of social disturbance because of that. And the government of Gujarat is considering to bring about a law to make it mandatory for parents to consent to law marriages. Otherwise, the law marriage cannot happen. You, you know, so how the political system, you know, is trying to ensure that those divisions are, uh, you know, uh, systematized, right? Uh, in, in this era, that's what uh, they are trying to talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, so <clears throat> the kind of sensation that uh, the girl from Pakistan coming to India and getting married and uh, similarly a Hindu girl going to Pakistan, uh, they were they had more kind of uh, media attention than any other issue that's happening in the country today. Mm -hmm. But those things are happening. The younger minds are, you know, uh, they are more exposed to reality. I, I mean, they are more, uh, you know, looking for freedom. And uh, but at the same time, the kind of uh, uh, tensions which are happening. So, I mean, we, we have a vocational training center called the Lid Shakti Kendra. And these are all young women between the age of 18 to 22 or so, you know, every week, uh, every month we get about 30, 40 of those young women, they live with us for two months. And by now <laughs> there are 10,700 plus graduates. And we give them a, a kind of a 1000 rupee award for writing the best diary you know, personal diary, promote them to write. Almost 70% of these young kids have attempted even at least once to commit suicide. So the friction between the old way of social thinking and their own world, which is looking at freedom and the kind of social confrontation that's happening and no space in society where there are people who will sit with them and, and, and uh, you know, uh, counsel them. And on the contrary, they will teach them the dharma that, you know, it is uh, that what you should listen to and what you should do and what you should think. Close your mind on the other side. And therefore, you know, the fanatism is, uh, has to be uh, protected as a way of life. Right. I get it. So one question I have. With the growth of a general atmosphere towards creation of a Hindu Rashtra, I'm not asking for your opinion. What does a Dalit, Dalit at the lowest level of the society, how does he or she view advent of a Hindu Rashtra? It's very clear that they believe, most people I have interacted with, they believe that Hindu Rashtra is nothing but strengthening the caste system. And you are not giving your opinion? No. See, this is one thing which has happened, uh, especially among the Dalits, is because of Buddha to Shahumara, Jyotiba Phule, Ambedkar, the kind of uh, ideological discourse which has happened within the community over the last uh, you know, few decades is amazing. And that's why, you know, now in Gujarat, the literacy gap between the Dalits and the general uh, population is almost uh, equal. And in some places, you'll find Dalit literacy higher than the uh, general, uh, this thing, because of the in investment into education. So even among the most poorest children, uh, they will say, Baba Sahib said, educate, you know, and therefore, and every family will have that photo. I mean, true. You know, they will say Jai Bhim, but not understand what the meaning of, uh, you know, what, what Ambedkar meant. But I saw that the people who didn't go to school, 
and people who are poor, they know much more about uh, social movements uh, than the people who are so-called educated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, the most common people, you know, they will say that this is nothing but uh, this, you know, strengthening untouchability. And I'm going to put two questions in one. Do you have hope? And do you have hope even if India elects or he opts to go for a Hindu Rashtra in the next election? Well, hope is the only possibility, you know, uh, to, to survive and uh, to be able to do something, yeah, right? And, uh, well, it's a mental aptitude that, uh, you know, actually it helps you, right? So, whatever progress that we have been able to bring about in our four decades of work is only because of hope. Mm -hmm. And many people ask, you know, uh, what kind of uh, progress have you achieved? I said, 40 years back when we began, we were taking one step forward and falling four, four, four steps backward. Today, we are falling only three steps backward, right? And we are hoping that it will become two and then one and one. Yes. But that's the hope, yes. And uh, actually, I believe that in our human life, it is the only the challenges which actually uh, make you more energetic. If I didn't have any challenges in life, I wouldn't be that creative, you know. And uh, therefore, it's very important to have... Uh, you know, a sword hanging on your head, uh, you know, a little insecurity to keep you agile. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I would ask one more question. The night before Independence Day celebration, a big message will be given from Red Fort tomorrow. I want an ordinary Dalit to give a message to this nation. What is the What is your message? What is his or her message? Well, the, the message is very clear. If you are not carrying all the people together and if you do not respect diversity, India is never going to become a strong nation. Thank you very much. Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. Thank you so much. <laughs> Come on, the 